Here's a crazy fact. Over the next 40 years, the world will use enough concrete to build a brand new New York City every single month. Isn't that crazy? Concrete is responsible for nearly 8% of global carbon emissions, which is more than the entire aviation industry. What's even crazier is that we've been using the same concrete recipe since 1824. Isn't it about time that we rethink concrete and start exploring other alternatives for concrete in our homes? There are so many amazing innovations and methods that are starting to emerge. So stick around till the end to make sure you catch them all. If you're new here, hi, I'm Christina, and I have been working in sustainable residential design for over a decade. I focus on innovative natural materials and passive systems so that we can protect future generations and preserve the earth as a place of beauty and inspiration. For me, working with nature instead of against it is not just about sustainability. It's about a path to a simpler way of living, one that is actually rooted and connected with nature. Before we get into how to minimize concrete in your home, I created a free guide for you if you are planning on designing and building your own home. It is a resilient property planning workbook and it'll help get all your ideas down on paper and start turning it into an actual plan. Okay, so what's the deal with concrete? The first problem is sand. Yep, you heard me right, sand. It's one of the main ingredients in concrete. But you might be thinking, what's the big deal? The world has plenty of sand, right? Well, with decades of global construction, the demand for sand has skyrocketed. Believe it or not, we've gotten to the point where we're actually running out of sand for building purposes. Sand is actually now the second most consumed resource after water. Yet despite sand covering a third of Earth's land, countries like Saudi Arabia are importing sand as far from Canada and Australia to meet their sand demand. Sand demand, I kind of like that. And that's because they can't use desert sand for making concrete. It's been shaped by the wind and turns into these round spheres, which are just too smooth to bind with in concrete. Builders do depend on the sharper grain sand which you find in rivers, beaches, and even seabeds. So the consequences of sand mining are actually quite severe. River dredging destroys habitats, it destabilizes banks, it worsens floods, and pollutes people, fish, and crops. So it's a big deal. Coastal scraping also erodes beaches that have already been threatened by rising seas. Well, the upstream dams actually block the natural replenishment that would normally happen. Researchers are experimenting with ways to make desert sand more usable, in some cases by heating and then crushing the grains. Some are also working with glass waste to replace the sand. Some solutions are on the horizon, like fair rock, for example. They are making a lot of progress, but by and large, sand still remains a huge problem for the concrete industry. The second problem is cement. While concrete is made up of several ingredients, cement is really the culprit behind the environmental impact that we see with concrete. Cement is the binder of the concrete and it's basically derived from limestone that's been heated at a high temperature um, up to 1400 degrees. Like I said, cement holds it all together. Um, so it's binding the gravel and the sand together with water. So when we heat the limestone, what ends up happening is we have carbon emissions. It produces carbon dioxide actually at a one-to-one -one ratio. So for every ton of calcium oxide produced from the limestone, one ton of CO2 is released. Some people even estimate it even higher, uh, one to 1.5 tons. Some folks are experimenting with renewable energy for heating the limestone and even carbon capture. Companies like Carbon Cure are doing this, um, working to capture the CO2 um, and then even mineralize it back into the concrete. But one of the most fascinating approaches, in my opinion, comes from studying the ancient Roman techniques of concrete. Learning from history can reveal simpler, more durable methods. Believe it or not, the concrete that we use today is far less durable than the formulas developed by Romans centuries ago. Roman concrete is really fascinating in the way that it was made because it uses volcanic ash and lime combined with seawater. By using volcanic ash from Mount Vesuvius, the Romans leveraged a material that had already been burned, meaning it didn't have to go through that 
that high temperature process to create the binding reaction that they needed. And the Roman seawalls are a remarkable example of this. The interaction between the magnesium, the salts in the seawater, and the volcanic ash actually strengthen the concrete over time, rather than degrading it like we see in modern concrete. Some of these structures have stood millennia, enduring waves, storms, and centuries of environmental factors. I see this as an example of biomimicry. Biomimicry is all about learning from nature and our own bodies to create designs that are more resilient and efficient. Magnesium actually plays a critical role in human health, particularly in strengthening bones. This really reflects how the seawater uh, with the magnesium reacted with the Roman concrete to strengthen and fortify those sea walls. Magnesium is the third most abundant element in seawater after sodium and chloride, and its interaction with the lime and the ash mirrors the natural hardening of bones and even coral. Essentially, by learning from history and nature, we can create stronger, longer lasting materials. Today, some innovators are taking cues from history and nature. One of the most exciting examples comes from a company called Cast Carbon. Instead of relying on Portland cement, which they don't use at all. They're making materials out of agricultural byproducts, things like rice hulls, walnut shells, forestry, biochar, and combined in a calcium magnesium binder. The biochar is a stable form of carbon made from plant material that's burned in low oxygen. Cast carbon is still in its early stages and currently just offering wall tiles and finished materials, but you can learn more about their work in the link in the description below. Replacing cement with SCMs, which stands for Supplemental Cementitious Materials, is one of the most promising solutions that we have today. These materials can partly or even fully replace a cement in the concrete mixes. There's a few categories to look at. There's silica, metal, and there's some natural ones. So let's just first talk about the silica. Materials rich in silica help strengthen the concrete and actually help resist water penetration as well. These can be found naturally or they can be found from industrial waste products as well. So some examples include, like I mentioned, the rice husk ash, um, which is made from burning the rice husk under controlled conditions. And silica fume is another example. Um, it's a very fine byproduct of silicone production. Then the next category is metal dust. Um, and this usually comes from iron powder, basically just rust. And this comes from, again, industrial byproducts, usually from steel production. And it just helps the concrete last longer and resist chemical damage. Examples of this are slag cement, also known as GGBFS, um, which can improve and strengthen against sulfate attack. Then there's more natural binders like volcanic ash or special clays that can react with the lime in the mix to form cement-like compounds. There's natural pozzolans, volcanic or calcinized clay. There's metakaolin, which I don't know if I'm saying that right, which is another highly reactive clay that reduces surface problems. Fly ash is something that you hear a lot when SEMs come up and it comes from coal combustion and it can replace a lot of the cement and reduce that industrial waste, but it's not really recommended for residential construction due to the heavy metal contaminants. And also, we don't know how much longer um, coal combustion is gonna be going on. Ferroc is another really cool material that's emerging, and it basically leverages the reaction between the silica and the iron powder to create a material that's actually stronger than traditional concrete. It has excellent flexural strength, which means it can handle both compression and tension, which just makes it really resistant to cracking. In fact, it's one of the few mass building materials that could be suitable for seismic zones. So if you haven't looked into Ferroc, I definitely recommend checking it out. It's not really widely available on the market yet, but there are still plenty of options for replacing the Portland cement with the SCMs, like I mentioned earlier, and still using traditional sand and gravel. One company that's leading the way with SEMs is a brand called Brimstone. Stone. There's other brands like Sika and Cmax, um, which offer a variety of concrete admixtures. So they're already practical off the shelf options for reducing cement use in your mixes. 
Some companies are experimenting with using bacteria to strengthen concrete, which is really interesting, similar to how coral grows naturally. So if this approach interests you, you can check out Biomason. They're leading the way with this and they're currently producing bacterial-based pavers for hardscaping. Promethis Materials is another good company using microorganisms to create strong concrete structures as well. And then there's the whole world of geopolymers, which is another exciting innovation. They can be highly insulating and fire resistant, making them great for certain applications. It's really strong, really durable, but the complexity of mixing and curing makes it less appealing for many people. Let me know in the comments if you guys have heard of any of these cement alternatives or if there's any that I missed. I'm sure this community of fellow innovators would really appreciate any extra pointers. Okay, so let's talk about design considerations. Sometimes we just cannot avoid concrete in our homes, foundations specifically. Many buildings rely on slab on grade, which is a single thick concrete slab poured directly onto the ground. Or they use stem walls, which are entirely concrete. That said, we're starting to see some innovations to reduce the concrete in our homes. One of them is called a slabless slab. And yes, that's really what people are calling it. And it's basically a system that consists of compacted gravel beneath a vapor barrier and then topped with a few layers of leveled plywood. While this method does offer less thermal storage, if you're doing a passive solar type design, they can still be a really viable solution if you have internal walls that are acting as your thermal mass. Another foundation option, if you're doing like a one-story building or something small, is a rubble trench foundation. And this actually was just included in the newest 2024 IRC code appendices. So it's really exciting when the IRC comes out with these new methods because it just makes it so much easier to advocate for these systems in your local jurisdiction. For your exterior walls, you can also look beyond concrete. There are many natural alternatives like rammed earth and compressed earth blocks that rely on compression for their strength. So with a small amount of cement added in some cases, these systems are really durable and they use a fraction of the cement that's required for standard concrete construction. Keep in mind that natural walls do require different rules to stay healthy and durable. So choosing the right finish is really critical for long-term performance of these wall systems. More specifically, do not go with the cement-based stucco on these natural walls. Um, in many cases, it's not vapor permeable, so it can basically trap moisture inside the wall, making your wall system fail faster. So instead, make sure to use vapor open, vapor permeable finishes um, like lime plasters, for example. Lime-based plasters are quite versatile. You can use them inside, outside, depending on the formula. And these can give you that concrete look without the actual concrete. And they do require maintenance over time, which is a trade-off. But there are systems like Tadillac, for example, which is a Moroccan plaster technique that can enhance the water resistance. But they are often way more labor intensive. Sometimes these plaster systems can be a labor of love. They say that there are two types of concrete. Concrete that has cracked and concrete that hasn't cracked yet. Concrete is durable, but it's not eternal. Over time, it can crack and expose the rebar inside. Once the seal is exposed, it can rust, which weakens the structure and disposing of or repairing the concrete can be tricky and energy intensive. An exciting innovation in this space is the invention of self-healing concrete. Some brands incorporate bacteria or calcium-based capsules that activate when the crack forms. The bacteria reacts with the air and produces this calcium carbonate, effectively sealing the crack and extending the life of the concrete. So if we do choose to use concrete in our buildings, it's really important to think beyond the initial pour. Also, if you do go with a concrete floor, don't just stain and seal it. You can consider using what's called a concrete densifier, and it basically penetrates within the surface and reacts with the calcium, and it basically seals the pores, it hardens the surface, and it reduces dusting. It just makes it more water resistant and even cutting down the need for any kind of polyurethane-based stain. Now there is a case to be made that using traditional concrete can still be positive. We can say that those negatives can be justified if we use proper design um, that maximizes its durability. We use it for thermal storage. We use it minimally. We 
utilize densifiers and hardeners. Plus, we can also use rebar that doesn't rust, like basalt and even hemp rebar that's an up and coming technology. So that's a whole different topic for another video though. So do check out hemp rebar if you haven't already. Okay, so that is a wrap on concrete alternatives in your home. I hope that this helps you make more educated decisions and feel more confident in your choices. If you're dreaming about building a resilient home that becomes a lasting legacy, you can check out the complimentary property planning workbook in the description below. It'll really help you get those ideas down on paper and turn them into a plan. If you're still exploring options for a natural resilient home, you can check out this video here, which will walk you through even more options um, to consider when designing your home. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Thank you.